It is Friday, June 28th, 2024. Welcome once again to Football Today. You know those dudes. Justin Panic, Bobby Skinner. I am Chris Rose. Producer Matty Mass filling in for Mike, who's got some gigs and taking a little vacation time. Why not here at the end of June? Gentlemen, we are down to our coaches list. We have ranked all 32 head coaches. Now, Pennick, this is your baby, mm. so we're going to let you run the show, my man. Chris Rose, Bobby Skinner, it's always great to be talking to you guys. This is like a coach's rankings. I don't want to put power rankings on the on t- on the uh, attaching at the end of everything. Coaches rankings. And the way that we're going to do this, we're going to go through our lists. We have a Rose's list, we have my list, we have Bobby Skinner's list, and then we also have a consensus list of the average of all three. We're going to break it down by the bottom 10, middle 12, and then the top 10. So the question that I want to start off with first before we talk about how do we, how do we base our like what do we base our criteria off of creating these lists, Bobby, it's your question. What coach's ranking is going to make this fan base angry? Hmm. So we'll, so we'll start off with you, Bobby. My mic was muted. Uh, for me, it would be either the Browns with Stefanski. I have a little lower, and then Shane Steichen, right? Because Shane Steichen, I want to rate him higher. Um, but I just I want to see a little more, have some questions with the defense. They kept Gus Bradley there, which I think is a little questionable, right? Like when we talk about Kevin O'Connell, you know, reason I have him highly ranked is he had a horrible defensive coordinator, fired him, brought in Brian Flores, and that, that unit turned around with, you know, less talent, honestly. So, um, I think, I think Shane Steichen probably, despite the fact that I like him a lot and I think he can jump on this, right? Like they were 10th in scoring last year. They went nine and eight you know, without, without a good quarterback. It's just, I just want to see a little more before I put him ahead of some other guys. I think Steichen's a good answer. Rose and I actually had Stefanski a lot higher than you, so that's something that we could talk about. Rose, is there anybody that sticks out to you? Yeah, I think on the overall list, I've got one guy who might even be considered a Hall of Fame coach somewhere down the line, and I'm not his biggest fan, but I appreciate what he has accomplished. For some reason, you guys have him ranked way lower than me. And so I think that we will uh, we will discuss that coming up in a bit because I'll be curious to see why you guys don't like him. And that's Mike Tomlin, right? Wow, for goodness sakes. Really? We were, we were giving it away right here when when we haven't even ordered our appetizers? No, no. Yeah, we we, we give a little teaser. We give a little teaser in the beginning because then people got to, if, if you want to get mad, you got you to gotta keep watching to stay mad. Exactly. So, I was dying. You know, I was trying to make him you know, figure out who I think that'd be Mike Tomlin. I thought it was going to be Mike Tomlin. And then I was like, Oh, we had him rated pretty. I had him rated hot. So it can't yeah, be Mike Tomlin. For goodness. You guys are like my wife. You guys can't keep any secrets. You have to know <laughs> everything right out the gate. You know, we checked both times that she was pregnant, whether we were having a boy or a girl. Like, I mean, for goodness sakes, let me save my Sean Payton for a little bit. Ah, it is yeah, I'm, I'm a big, you should know the gender before. And like, there's a lot of preparing going, right? Like, <laughs> you know, like, I don't want to be surprised. You know when I when that thing pops out, I haven't had a kid yet, yeah. but I, I know that's where where I'll where I'll land. I just mm. want to let you know you're going to get a great gift from me. Whenever that is, if that's five years, ten years, I, I hope I hope we're still working together. You'll get a great gift. It'll just show up. You'll be like, oh, oh. I remember when I used to work with Rose at Weirdo. Perfect. I'm gonna I'm gonna hold that to you. <laughs> oh yeah, don't worry. Good, I'm good for it. All right, let's go, Panic. We're yeah. off track. So basically. Now I want to know is what did you base your criteria off of? Because we we don't know every single NFL coach and every single NFL team. If you, if your favorite team is you know the, the like you said the Indianapolis Colts and you're a big Shane Steichen guy, um, I don't know Shane Steichen as well as like I would know Brian Dable uh, or as Chris would know Kevin Stefanski. So uh, let's just lay it out there. What did you kind of base your criteria off of when forming your list, Rose? It's hard because I felt like I was all over the place on this. And I think that if people did this exercise at home, that you would feel exactly the same because my criteria moved. Like I put in a list and I forgot to put Dan Campbell in. Okay. Mm. Like I was just doing it on my head. I didn't have the standings in front of me. And I was like, wait, I've only got 30 coaches. And there were two guys that I forgot. I forgot Callahan and I forgot Dan Campbell. And I was like, ah, oh, shit. How do I forget Dan Campbell? And then I had to go back and look, and I was like, oh, my God, I have to renumber all this stuff again. Um, So I think the big thing with me is when you're an NFL head coach, 
I, you have to break them up into categories because some of these guys are play callers. Some of them are just CEOs of companies. Like a John Harbaugh has never been a play caller. He, right? He came, he was a special teams coach, but he has arguably been a, a Hall of Fame type coach. So what is it that makes him special as opposed to a Sean McVay, right? Who has been calling plays since day one. I think the first thing you think about him is that he's a tremendous play caller. Same with Kyle Shanahan and all that sort of stuff. So how do I measure a guy in John Harbaugh who's won a Super Bowl as a coach versus Sean McVay who's won it as a head coach versus Kyle Shanahan who's been in two and has had fourth quarter leads as a head coach but hasn't quite slammed the door on it. And so to me, it was a real challenge to be honest with you because I felt like it was a moving target. There were times where I like, oh yeah, the play caller, I could do that. Oh no, just being a CEO, just doing that. It it was really hard for me, guys. Yeah, it's it's you naturally want to push up like the offensive, you know, scheme, yes. you know, the the scheme buzzword guys up the list. So mine was like, how do you elevate players? Right? Do players have their best season with you under coaching? Um, for like the Harbaugh, this is goes for all of them, but it's more specifically for the Harbaugh's and Tomlin types is like. Do you create good coaches, right? And if you have a bad coach, do you move on from that and replace? Like John Harbaugh, right? Remember the year they won the Super Bowl? They fired Cam Cameron in the middle of the year, right? And that offense uh, started clicking, right? He's he's changed, like went from Wink Martindale to Mike McDonald, right? Wink Martindale, you know, coached back-to-back number one defenses, had an off year, and then they moved off of him for Mike McDonald, you know, bringing in... um. What's the 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 Chargers offensive coordinator, the run game guy? Greg Ro- brought Greg, Greg Roman in Roman. for Lamar. Once Lamar developed, okay, let's bring it. Let's let's bring in Todd Monk and now let's bring this offense to another level. So for guys like that, um, so it's like kind of handling of your coaches. Does your scheme set yourself apart? And then ultimately, like, do you elevate players? Do you make role players look like good players? Do you make bad players look like role players? And then get the most out of your great players. Yeah, I agree with both of you and. As I was finalizing this list, I'm like, I thought of like the perfect, perfect, like common denominator. And, you know, Bobby said, you know, kind of form, you know, forming up these players, but player development, you know, if you draft a guy that's maybe you know, a little unconventional or maybe even you're a head coach that doesn't have maybe even the best communication with the front office. And I think a lot of these, a lot of these good coaches at the top do have very good communication with the front office. That's why the pairings are so good. And that's why those coaches are so good because everything is working. But even if it's a guy that's a little unconventional from out of your style, are you able to kind of develop them, change your style, change your philosophy? You know, and we'll just take John Harbaugh as 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 an example here. I I can't believe the change that the Baltimore Ravens have gone under as a as an organization to make Lamar Jackson work. I think if it's like if it's if you're stubborn and stuck to your ways, you know, sticking to your ways of just this under center, you know, conventional passing offense and you draft a guy like Lamar Jackson. Lamar Jackson is maybe seen as a backup quarterback at this point, but Lamar has such an interesting skill set, and a guy like John Harbaugh is able to utilize that skill set and find a way to make it work, and now we see Lamar as an elite quarterback because the coaching and the scheme was able to fit to his skill set. So that's why a guy like that is so awesome and so good. So that was a huge part of it, player development, and you know, are the players that you draft and are your team – um, you know, how are they developing and are they turning into possible stars? Huge part for me. All right. So do we want to start reading off, reading off these lists, fellas? Well, yeah, let's I, do it. Yeah. I think, are, are we going to take the cumulative, the, the yeah. average score? We're, we're going to do that. And then yeah. we can, we can say where we had guys fall or rise. Yeah. That's, that's a great, great idea. I say this before I didn't put, I put all the rookie coaches at the bottom. Because there's way too much projection and true. Like I love Mike McDonald as a hire, but guess like Brandon Staley was seen as this great hire, whiz kid type thing. And look how so I just I just put the rookie coaches at at the bottom because you just don't have anything to judge them off besides so you, Dan Quinn, who I don't like, and then Raheem Morris. So you took the easy way out, is what you're telling us. I did with quarterbacks. I'll project and stuff like that because it's like. You know, people complain about, our. oh, you had Caleb Williams or Drake May ahead of these guys. Like, yes. Yes, I do. But with coaches, I decided to, like you said, take the easy way out. But isn't that the fun part of doing it is that you want to try and guess? You want to try take your fly? Are you the guy that fills out the NCAA tournament 
bracket and you go chalk the whole way no i'm actually no. i'm actually the opposite but it's yeah and there's so much more to the head coaching job besides you know the buzzword of scheme um that is like brandon staley was looked at as a great defensive coordinator with the rams and look how bad that went with the chargers right? i think we all relatively had the new hires closer to the bottom uh because yes, i like I, I i like i'm highest on Mike McDonald, but I'll I'll just give it away right now. Like he he's at he's at twenty three on our consensus mm -hmm. list, and I have him at twenty two. Bobby, you have him at twenty seven. But you just admitted that the highest kinda... of the rookie coaches is Mike McDonald. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And then Rose, where did you have him? I also had him at twenty two. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I actually, I mean, I'll get into it here. We can even get into it right now. Why I have Mike McDonald higher than even some of these other vet veteran coaches is because he has a track record of developing players. And I also think he's assembled a very interesting staff with the Seattle Seahawks. Justin Mat Matabuke, who was one of the best interior defensive linemen in the National Football League last year, it was his third year, and third year's kind of like, the, you know, you circle those, you know, that third year for these interior defensive linemen to break out sometimes in the NFL. But he was never a big sack guy. You know, then he turned into leading all interior defensive linemen in the NFL in sacks last year. Plus having like 33 QB hits, according to Pro Football Reference, that was a huge jump up from what he did in the past. Uh, Kyle Hamilton's development, Geno Stone's development as well. That's a guy That's a guy that was like third Jadavion on their Clowney depth chart. had his best year. And, and Kyle Van Noy, both of those guys had like resurgent years. Uh, the development of Patrick Queen, Wink Martindale, he looked terrible under Wink Martindale. And then now Patrick Queen is getting almost $20 million, $20 million on the contract. So I think Mike McDonald, uh, especially for... A, a team that needs help defensively. I think he's going to be able to develop those guys. There's talent there. There's names there, but they're kind of raw and they're kind of in, they were kind of in spots last year that maybe they shouldn't be. I think McDonald's going to get them in the right spot. And offensively, I'm excited to see what input he could have and also the staff that he's uh, compromised as well. So I'm I'm high on I'm 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 drinking the Mike McDonald Kool Aid this year. Well, let me flip it on you guys. You guys are so high on Mike McDonald. Why'd you only have him 22nd? Because I also did have a little bit of bias towards I didn't want to put a new coach so high. But I feel like 22nd for a new coach is kind of high. It's pretty high. Yeah, it's yeah. pretty high. Like, if we had uh, if we had done this last year, if we had been around, uh, we were, where would we have had D'Amico Ryans? Very low because you're like, oh, my God, that team is going to suck. Like, he's, mm -hmm. he was great as a D.C. up there in San Francisco. Like, we believe in who he is. If you've spent any time around D'Amico Ryans, and I can tell you this, because I called a couple of his games when he was with the Texans, you have those production meetings with him. When he walked out of the room, you all look at each other. You're like, that's a head coach. And I don't know when it is because he's still playing at a really high level. That dude's going to be a head coach. So you knew you had that feeling. And that's part of the reason that I put Mike McDonald where he is. Because every year there is a D'Amico Ryans. There's going to be a guy who hits it out of the park. Now, do I think he's going to win the NFC West? No. Do I think he's even going to contend for it? No. I think they're going to finish third. They might get eight or nine wins. I, I don't know, but I'm going to feel like he is not overwhelmed. How often do we see rookie head coaches? And you're like, Jesus, there's no way this is going to work. You can see it in year one. You really can. Hell, we even saw it with Staley in year one with Dude. stuff. And, and that you know, he made the playoffs in his tenure there, but you always felt like he was overmatched with something. I don't think I'm going to feel that way about Mike McDonald one bit. So can I say this too? I like I said, I put all the rookies there, so I have them twenty seven to thirty two. I like him way more than all the other coaches on this list. Yeah. Right? Like Gerard Mayo, I, I think Gerard Mayo could suffer from organizational yes. dysfunction. Yep. You know, and you know, and part of me is like, why didn't they interview other head coaches, right? Even if they wanted to land why why not? Let someone else. I think Callahan's gonna work out. Having his father there, you kind of see those offensive guys and then Canales, I worry about, right? Like, I I didn't buy, like I don't buy into that one year of Tampa of like this guy is a genius. Uh, Dan Quinn, I you know when the Giants were looking for a head coach two years ago, he was my please do not hire. I don't like the way everything yeah. went in Atlanta. I think well, he let, got me, a let me let me let me read of off credit the, for Shanahan. Let me read off the bottom twelve first yeah. before we start getting into some of these specific coaches. So Dave Canales again is at thirty two. We had tied for thirty Gerard Mayo, Raheem Morris. Uh, twenty ninth we had Brian Callahan. Tied for twenty seventh we had Dan Quinn and Jonathan Gannon, and then tied for 25th, we had Robert Sala and Antonio Pierce. We had Matt Eberflus, 24, and then Mike McDonald on our consensus average. Mike McDonald is 
third. So you're Bobby. You were talking about Dan Quinn. Yeah, I, I mean, I've just never been a big fan of Dan. I thought he got a lot of credit for like I think like he got credit for what Kyle Shanahan did in Atlanta, right? And you saw how those defenses fell off, you know, after Kyle Shanahan left, and then the offense obviously wasn't doing the same exact thing. And then in Dallas, I think he did an awesome job with that talent, but he's also very much like, hey, this is this is a what we run type of defense, and offenses. Good offensive coaches pick up on this stuff, and you've seen the Dallas suffer in the playoffs partly due to that. Yeah. Um. So with Washington, with that talent, like again, we we've talked about it in our NFC East preview. Like they have formed a defense in Dan Quinn's image, but it's like just the ultimate like Dan Quinn light with the with the guys that they brought in. I just I I, I was he was when the Giants were doing head coaching searches in 2022, he was last on my list. I, I will admit I had him the highest out of all of us. I had him at 21. Mm. Um, and I understand your Kyle Shanahan point. I really do. And he got fired. The last year he was there, I think he went 0-5, and, and then they got rid of him. Yeah, it was before a mess. That, before that, his worst record was 7-9. and nine, And he won a couple of division titles. I know he had a league MVP in Matt Ryan. I know that Kyle Shanahan had that offense click, and I understand it. I think that he could do some good things here it's maybe a, a few ticks too high but I mean I wouldn't have put him at 27 or 28 or whatever you guys have him at 27th on the average so that means you guys really panned him yeah. I suppose the one I'm really interested in there's a couple of names here none of us are buying into the Antonio Pierce deal right where I had him at 29th where'd you guys have him Bobby I had him at 23 I'm you willing to give him a shot. I just I didn't love the hiring of Luke Getze as the offensive coordinator, um, and it's just how how sound is Las Vegas structurally, right? Like you look at we talk about their talent and that quarterback. So he's kind of I think he's kind of set up to fail, and I just don't think that type of head coach, like the CEO type, works to the best when you just don't like. I think those one those are the types of coaches that work really well. With good talent, and I, I don't like the the coaching uh, hire of Luke Getzey as OC. Uh, Antonio Pierce seems more like a college rah rah coach than anything else. I mean, the dude was it was fun, it was cute when he's smoking stogies with everybody in the locker room afterward. But how often are we going to be doing that? Yeah, I mean, it, it every... feels like you know the perfect situation for an interim head coach, Chris, where it's like you want a vibes guy, you want a guy that's going to come in here and rally the troops and kind of get through the season. And I think the, like, let's just use Tim and D'Amico Ryans as example, as examples, right? Because they're both former linebackers, former players. These guys can speak to the locker room, right? But D'Amico Ryans had years of experience as a, as a successful defensive coordinator and defensive play caller. And, you know, everything that you hear about, you know, I, I read an athletic article recently from, you know, J.J. Watt was talking a lot about how, you know, it almost felt like he was a coach when he was a player. And I'm sure Antonio Pierce is the same way. Same way, you know, Antonio Pierce learned from Steve Spagnolo, all kind of stuff. But if you go, he's his coaching history starts in 2014, where he was a high school coach for four years. Then he was a linebackers coach and a recruiting coordinator for Arizona State for two years. Stays in Arizona State with the same responsibilities, except defensive coordinator was added to his resume. And then goes straight to the NFL as a linebackers coach. Is not it doesn't stop at defensive coordinator or anything. And now as a head coach in in 2024. So. I don't know. For I don't. I don't want to sit here and say, especially as a Giants fan, I'd be criminal for me to sit here and say I think the moment's going to be too big for Antonio Pierce. But I kind of feel like the moment's going to be a little too big for Antonio Pierce this year. Not. I just don't feel like there's enough experience there. I think he's set up to fail too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they don't have. They have the worst quarterback situation moving forward because they don't have any. They don't have any direction there. I think there is one part of it that could help them out. Is that Marvin Lewis is going to be there, kind of. You know, as a, as a some people make fun of it. Marvin Lewis did get the Bengals to five straight playoffs. Right? Oh, I think Marvin Lewis was a good coach. Everyone clowns on him. No, oh. and I loved. I I know I loved his mindset of like we will take, we will take your tr like essentially troubled people, right? right? People who had had run-ins with the law and stuff like that. And I like I like that they made that as an identity. And he kept a lot of those guys in line and and got the most out. So I I liked. I mean, he had like you said, he had uh, Andy Dalton going to the playoffs every single year for the most part. Uh, Pennant, can we talk about one other guy in the in the bottom? 
Well, I have a trivia question. Where where was Dan Quinn's defense ranked the year they went to the Super Bowl? Wasn't good. Um, I'll say 28th. Close, 27th. Ugh. Damn it. I know my Dan Quinn. I know my Dan Quinn. Yeah, Rose, where do you want to where do you want to move? I do think we need to touch on Sala a little bit. Is he really not a good coach or has he just been in a terrible situation? I think he's contributed to the terrible situation, right? Like that defense is awesome, right? He's a good defensive coach. They they've got that unit humming. But for a team that the situation can breed dysfunction, I think he's done nothing to make it better right like I, I look back at the, the handling of Zach Wilson two years ago where it's like that was so immature the way that they did that right it was it was crazy um and the offense has so been, been so bad f- hiring Hackett and keeping Hackett just to please Aaron like I just think like yeah you go get Aaron Rodgers don't that's a, I, that's a great decision for the Jets to go and do it but I just think Sala doesn't really have control of the organization He's a good defensive coach. I just don't think he like, like he. I don't think he has control of 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 that organization, and it's a team that's he makes he makes it easier for chaos to happen yeah. there. I feel like this even started before Rogers got here. Where now it really feels yeah. like the, the Zach the, Wilson handling was awful. The inmates are running the asylum. That's really it. It is really what it feels like. And I liked initially, you know, if we want to talk about staffs, you know, kind of taking from the 49ers a little bit, taking from that Shanahan tree, and then it's like, oh, let's just go get Nathaniel Hackett who is a terrible, terrible coach. And that was for Aaron Rodgers, which I, I get it. That that was their plan. But yeah, but why didn't they fire Nathaniel Hackett? Because Aaron Rodgers is here and they don't want exactly. Him to. And that and that, so that to me is is a head coach who's not secure and and like you said, he doesn't he doesn't run that organization. Yeah. I feel like it's Aaron Rodgers' team. So that's why I feel like it's very it's very justified. Uh I had Keeping had, Zach Wilson and not getting a backup QB. I know. Again, we're blaming them some for the GM and stuff, but like the way the way that they handled that Zach Wilson thing in 2022, to where it was like, oh, I've never seen someone more outcast in my life. Yeah, they were wearing like, Mike you White should be, shirts. You should be in the GM's office. Like, get me a backup quarterback. This guy cannot be my backup quarterback. We are not saving this. This idea that oh, he just needs to spend some time with Aaron Rodgers. Like, no, we need to go find a real backup quarterback. Yeah, I had him 29th, and then he wound up. Uh, 20, you know, tied for 25th on our consensus. I had him 24th. Yeah. Rose, I want to be quick. I want to be quick on this. Mm-hmm. You had Jonathan Gannon last. Yeah. I, I feel like past, I can't get past the introduction. I'm sorry. <sighs> I cannot get past the introduction, particularly when you're not winning games. They were <laughs> covering. Picking- what you are here? Here's my thing. I don't know thing. what you're talking about. I'm an oh, no, uh, sorry. Boy. Excuse I no me. I never. About. They I covered. Never, they have really good coverage. They had really. They had really good coverage. I. I didn't. I didn't say that. Hey, this is hard for me. He's a Cleveland <laughs> guy, dude. Like I. I don't want to put a Cleveland guy last, but I have to be honest with you. I'm having a hard time getting, getting past this. Like, I'm going to. I'm going to rephrase what I just said. They played closer in games than what they were expected to last right. year, and they were one of the best teams in the NFL at doing that. Congratulations. When I look at a guy's <laughs> record, I look at wins and losses, not yeah. close losses. <laughs> Sorry, this isn't kindergarten where you get patted on the head for trying hard. Uh, they now I, they I, had I, awful talent. Yeah. Yes, but they did. I watched a little bit of Cardinals film last year. And, you know, I'm not the best film guy in the world, right? I'm not like these coaches or like these great ana- analysts who like have years and years of like, he call it, like, but I was like, oh, there's the blitz is coming. Look where this guy's lying. Like, I think. Is maybe because of the talent on that team and how young it was, but it was very like easy to telegraph what they were doing defensively for a defensive coach. And hey, that defense, and I know it ranked good, but like Eagles fans weren't missing him, Jonathan. You know, weren't 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 uh, weren't sad to see Jonathan Gannon go. Now he would have been a hell of an upgrade over what they had last year. Um, but so I, I had Gannon twenty. Fourth, item twenty, item twenty fifth. But I, I saw Rose put him last. I'm like, oh my! I God. think he can jump up though when you you get him some talent. Yeah. Okay, we'll see. I'll take it back then at yeah. the end of the year. All Here right, we're, we're rolling. We're moving. This is the yeah. the the longest uh, tier that we have, so to speak. The eleven to twenty two. We have Todd Bowles at twenty two. We have Dennis Allen at twenty one. Rose and I had him down, and Bobby. Bobby had him much higher than NFC South episode recency bias. Recency I'm a bias. I, I, that made me a Dennis Allen guy. Yeah. Shane Steichen at 20. 
Doug Peterson and Nick Sirianni, ironically enough, are tied for 18th. Mike McCarthy at 17. Brian Dable at 16. Sean McDermott at 15. Zach Taylor, 14. Sean Payton, 13. Kevin O'Connell, 12. And Mike McDaniel, 11. Where do we want to attack first? I have a question. Mm-hmm. Go for it. Um, I think... No, let's start here. The Brian Dable to Shane Steichen territory. So that's 16 to 20. So it's going down from 16. Brian Dable, Mike McCarthy, Nick Sirianni, Doug Peterson, Shane Steichen. I think that territory is fascinating. And I feel I kind of feel like any of those coaches can be intertwined with the coach next to him. I want to break down that area of our rankings and discuss some of these coaches. Why is this guy better than the next? Or what do we agree with? What do we disagree with? Well, I would I would put it like who are the overachievers in that group and who are the underachievers with like the talent that they have, you know? So like Shane Steichen, overachiever, Doug Peterson, kind of in the middle, Nick Sirianni. I mean, if you go off this last year, they underachieve with that talent that they have. And I mean, to have a collapse like that, I, I, I really do hold it against him. Now I think they're going to figure it out this year with the, you know, with, um, with the coordinators they brought in with Kellen Moore, who again, I'm not the biggest fan of and um, Vic Fangio, who I am a, the, one of the biggest fans of but like the way that that collapse is a really ding on him Mike McCarthy kind of have underachieved when you think of the grand uh you know the big picture Brian Dable I think he's overachieved with the talent he has but how he handles his coaches is obviously a huge red flag and then who who was the other one no that's it that's that the, okay. that's the territory that I'm that I'm really hyper focusing on right now because yeah, I, so I, I rank those ropes. guys by like overachiever like versus it, it, underachiever yeah, like Rose, if if you were to if we were to totally flip this and we were to put Steichen ahead mm-hmm. of Dable or Dable at 20 and Steichen at 16 in between all these guys, I wouldn't blink. Like if you were to switch any of these guys from 16 to 20, I would be kind of okay with it. I am surprised at the number of guys who have either participated or won a Super Bowl. I know. That are I in know. this group, right? Because at the end of the day, you judge quarterbacks and head coaches on Super Bowls. So look at this group. We have going backward, Doug Peterson won a Super Bowl. Nick Sirianni, he's coached three years. He's made the playoffs three years. He has been to a Super Bowl and almost freaking won the thing. Mike McCarthy, I know it feels like a lifetime ago in Super Bowl 45, but he did win one. Like that is amazing that we have a group of guys that have won because there aren't that many dudes on this list that have won a Super Bowl. And we just took couple of them and just threw them right in the middle. Basically yeah. said you're average head football coaches. I think we've all felt that way about Mike McCarthy. And, you know, the first thing he did when he became the Cowboys coach was telling everybody that he actually lied to the Cowboys. That <laughs> What was it that he was? Uh, I'm not actually a big analytics guy. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah so that was like the first saying thing he did. He's like he told him they watched every single game yes. of film the Cowboys, which, again, if like you had the whole year off, it's not that hard to do as you're a coach. And they did that big PR stunt where it's like the coaches get together and right. looking at it, and it was just like, yeah, they got together every once in a while and kind of just hung out. Ironically right, enough, beer. Mike McCarthy is a very big like early down pass frequency guy and very big yeah. That's go what for he learned guy. was like the Twitter t- the Twitter analytic talking hmm. points where it's like, yeah, well, you didn't reinvent the wheel here, Twitter. Like going for it on fourth down is not the craziest thing in the world. Yeah. Uh, okay. So why are we so mean to Nick Sirianni? Why is that panic? For me, it's. I, we, I, we've we kind of started off this episode by saying if a coach needs to elevate talent, maybe in the face of not talent being there, the Eagles have talent. And somehow Nick Sirianni made that so much worse last year. Where, you know, the Eagles were playing good football and they had the best record in the NFC. But yet there was still a feeling, and I disagreed with these people at the time. I was wrong because I just thought that the talent would figure it out. People are like, the Eagles aren't playing good football. And then they legit became one of the worst teams in football with a Super Bowl roster. I don't know if, you know, I don't know, like, are Eagles fans mad that Nick Sirianni is this low? Or are they this low on Nick Sirianni? Do they want him out? I think he deserves the opportunity to try and turn it around. 
But that collapse for that talented of a roster to look that bad, that's why I have him here. It makes him look like a product of his coordinators the year before, where Shane Steichen, we all really like. Again, I, I said that's the, that's the fan base that probably has the most right to be mad at this ranking. You know, Jonathan Gannon went... Like, he made he took the the bad situation made it work. Like, going to Matt Patricia with what M- Matt Patricia had in mind was awful, right? And for an offensive coach, again, like, the way they collapsed wasn't just like, oh, they got injured or... You know, they lost, they, you know, they lost some shootouts. No, like they just didn't have answers for like the, like, like elementary stuff. Why couldn't an offensive coach go and take control of that? So the way that they collapse, like Justin said, is it's not just a team that like didn't finish strong. Like they were like, they were, they were awful to end the season. They were a bad football team with all of that talent. The reason I had him ranked right in the middle at 16 is two words. Big Dom. What head coach needs a babysitter to make sure that he can stay on task? I mean, what, what are we doing here? Like, is he is he really that emotional during football? Like, I want my pilots and my NFL coaches to be this. I Even Mike Tomlin, who can get a little energetic, still, he's like, he knows what lane he has to stay in. I can't have a freaking babysitter for my coach. I cannot have that. It drives me nuts. They're like, well, you know how important Big Dom is to keep Nick Sirian. What? I don't know. Yeah, you- that's that's insane. Um you, you know how important I, I don't know. I was just thinking to myself, now now I need to I need to see if there's like a a, a seven minute read athletic article on that that's been written by one of these athletic reporters about how Big Dom's like what what does he got what hired does Big as Dom a coach do? this offseason? They yeah. gave him like some type of coaching title. Oh, of yeah. course. He got promoted. Um, here's the thing. I think Sirianni's stock is going to go back up though this year. Well, okay. So right now, if we were to ask 100 Eagles fans, is Nick Sirianni a top 12 coach in the NFL? Do you think more people are putting him in the top 12 or not in the top 12? Bob? I think he's out. It's tough. It's tough to read an Eagles fan's mind because they could be the <laughs> ultimate, like he's the best, or they could be like he's 32nd. I, I would say out just because there's a lot of good coaches in the league, right? We're not we're not looking at number twelve and saying, oh, what a bad coach. Like we're lo- I'm looking at number twelve and I'm like, damn, that's a really good coach in Kevin O'Connell we have ranked there. Mm. Okay, Penick, you got anybody else you want to hit on here in this uh, in the midsection? Yeah, you meant. I mean, you mentioned a Super Bowl winning coach. I feel like I actually had Doug Peterson in my list. I had Doug Peterson higher highest. Higher than any of these guys. So I had Doug Peterson, 16, Mike McCarthy, 17, Dable, 18, Steichen and Sirianni, 19, 20. Why should I not be... I'm not high on Doug Peterson. I have him ranked 16. But talk to me about Doug Peterson and why maybe he shouldn't be as high as some of these other guys. Sorry, I thought last year was a real black mark on his coaching because I thought that going into it, that the Jags were the easiest team to pick to win their division. Yeah. I really felt that way. Maybe, maybe San Francisco. But other than that, I mean, I, w- I was like, who, who else is going to contend? You've got a rookie quarterback and a rookie coach in both Houston and Indianapolis. And Tennessee, they don't, they don't have a quarterback. So I was like, they're going to waltz to a division crown. And not only did they not win the division, they didn't even make the playoffs. Like, that is a lot on Doug Peterson. I know his quarterback was banged up and turned the ball over and stuff, but come on. What are we doing? And I don't know. I don't, that's yeah. why I felt. I think I think the way things ended in Philly still um, leave a little bit of a bad taste in your mouth, right? Where, again, I think uh, similar to Robert Sala, where it's do you have control – of your organization, like even think about back to that week seventeen game, right? Where all right, we're going to take Jalen Hurts out, we're going to tank for this, right? He's he agreed that was a t- that wasn't his decision, and he ended up losing his job because of that, right? Like that that started the dominoes falling of like you know what, it's better if we part ways with a guy who won a Super Bowl for them, you know, two years before that, um, and you've seen it this year, you know, with Jack, like giving Press Taylor the offensive coordinator more control and how that goes, like, and then here's another thing, I th- Trevor Lawrence shouldn't have the stigmas around him with an offensive coach with the player that Trevor Lawrence is. How about that? Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, I picked Trevor Lawrence to, you know, I I, pick, I picked him to win MVP last year. That was like, it, it, like not a dark horse that I thought at the time wasn't really a dark horse because I thought Calvin Ridley was going to unlock all of that um, and everything like that, and it just didn't happen. But I will say, kind of crazy how the Jaguars and the Eagles season kind of mirrored each other. Teams with really good records heading into the latter part of the season, and then the month of December and January, the Jaguars just don't win another game. But that's also coincided with Trevor Lawrence getting hurt. But even before that, Trevor Lawrence wasn't playing well, but at least Doug Peterson and his Jacksonville Jaguars were playing really good defense, and that's kind of how they were winning football games. So I don't know. Like I I think the Jaguars' offense is just naturally, I kind of like the personnel this year, kind of like it. I like the... I thought Calvin Ridley was going to fit like a glove, and he didn't, but I actually think the receivers that they have this year and adding Brian Thomas to that mix, I actually think that's going to be better for Lawrence, and it's better for Peterson's offense, so we'll we'll certainly see. We'll certainly see. I want to move to the offensive play callers that we have kind of lined up in a row, where we have Mike McDaniel. I, th- I Kev- think, sorry, but I, th- I think the hiring of Ryan Nielsen as a defensive coordinator this year might help him. Again, we talked a little bit about their defense on Atlanta's episode, but... He was the DC for Atlanta, so I, I think that could help him. It's interesting if he takes more control of the offense. But go ahead, yeah. Justin. Sorry. No, and and that defense does have a you know a decent amount of talent in there too. Mike McDaniel, Kevin O'Connell, and Kevin Stefanski. They are all back to back to back with each other at least on. No, what list? What list am I getting this from? Well, you're missing a whole bunch there. You're missing. I, you're I looking think at 10, your list, Justin. I'm looking at I, my list. Yeah, I think 10 through 15 is fascinating. You've got McDermott at 15, Zach Taylor at 14, Sean Payton at 13, Kevin O'Connell at 12, Mike McDaniel at 11, Kevin Stefanski at 10. So that covers a ton of play callers and then Sean McDermott in there as well. Yeah, tell us why you love Sean Payton and Chris Rose. We talked about the beginning of the episode. I'm more interested in why you guys aren't. I know that last year was crappy, but that was horrible. But, and I'm not the biggest Peyton fan because I really feel like he's one of those dudes who thinks he he invented the offensive side of the football. Like he digs himself some Sean Peyton, and that's okay. Nothing wrong with that. Got to have confidence, and he's he oozes it. But I thought he was a pretty good coach in New Orleans. No. Yeah, if this was New Orleans, but like you said, I I feel like he's kind of changed a little bit since since then, right? Like you I said, he feels like he feels like he like he's, he feels like a new man with Denver, and I don't think it's for the better. It's possible, but I can I can't judge. I think handling of the Russell Wilson situation was really bad. That was awful, right? And it's I hey, horrible, horrible. Russell, but- I, I listen, I, I'm not a Russell, you know, this Russell Wilson guy, but that was. I mean, that's just awful CEO, you know, right there for a guy yeah. who's been doing it for a long time. And that's some of the, the lure of him is he can run the organization. Yeah. I don't care well, how weird Russell Wilson is or how his teammates feel about him. I, I just feel like you don't do that. You know what I mean? On a winning streak. Yeah. Uh, you have to remember where are Sean Payton's roots from? Bill the Parcells. Oh, Bill, yeah. Bill, Bill, Bill Parcells. That's Jim, who he learned under Jim Fossil. Who he cr- remember he cr- him crying about um, you know Fossil. Oh, he, you know he threw me under the bus after like, and then you go and do you know, and he's become the ultimate like throw people under the bus type of guy, which is. I, I, and I'm not saying that this which is... eventually can 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 turn. Eventually, like people will turn against you. So I don't. I don't think he. I think he did a pretty good job with Denver last year, and I have him ranked. Um, nineteenth, I guess. So, 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 19. pretty low. Yeah, that's very low. You're saying that he's w- worse than the average NFL coach, substantially worse. I well, here's 10. what I'll, here's what I'll go. I'll go through my eleven through eighteen and tell me what. Tell me one who you're like. That's clearly a worse coach. Shane Steichen, Mike McCarthy, Sean McDermott, Kevin Stefanski, Zach Taylor, uh, Brian Dable, Dennis Allen, Mike Tomlin. Why is he a bet? Why is he a worse coach than Brian Dable? This could be by I I I've, I've seen Brian Dable overachieve with like two years. Like think about how bad the shit went last year for the Giants. They won six games. You know, going to the playoffs, winning that playoff game. Now the knock against Dable is how he handles his coaching staff. That's a pretty big knock. Yeah. So I I yeah, you can make that argument. 
And I again, mean, there's, pro- there's probably a little bit of bias sinking in, but I, I think br- you look at you look at the talent that the Giants have had the last two years, and to win a combined 17 games with those with that talent is, I mean, he, Brian Dable got Tommy DeVito to win three straight games. I, I understand all that. You can also argue that the Denver situation roster wise is not much better, and and no. I think the the Denver offense was. Uh, almost average whereas the Giants offense like their efficiency numbers near the Carolina Panthers where at least the Denver Bron- at least the Broncos are nearing are nearing average uh, and I really don't think like that personnel we're also one uh, year away from David winning coach of the year too we are we are uh, but you're also just a couple years away from, you know we're you know 2020 we're uh, I, I think Sean Payton went 12 and 4 um but by, by the way um Denver has not made the playoffs since winning Super Bowl 50 so this is not a one-year Sean Payton error. This is him. I agree. I, I thought the way he handled the Russell Wilson stuff was embarrassing. Embarrassing. Maybe he takes a step back in the offseason and realizes, I got to clean up my shit a little bit. Probably not. But he's still... Quarterback situation still ironed out here. I don't think that group is going to win him a ton of games. But if... Like, I, we always thought that at, by this point, he'd be coaching the Dallas Cowboys, right? Yeah. I have this question with Sean Payton, too, and I put Jim Harbaugh in a similar light, and it did impact where I put them in rankings. I have more of a question of Sean Payton and Jim Harbaugh's commitment to the organization that they're currently in than the organization's commitment to them. Thoughts? I don't get that. Like, Isn't it, is, I mean, Sean Payton's kind of like building for the long run, right? Do you, but do you, do you really get the sense that he's he's there and he's in it absolutely and i think yep. the same thing with jim harbaugh i i think jim harbaugh is like at five year five it can wear a little thin if you're not the best but i mean i love jim harbaugh you're gonna see in my rankings but um yeah i, I think i think i man I, and uh, rose has talked me out a little bit of of my sean payton ranking um i don't want you to change this because i'm right I mean, really well, no that's not <laughs> no uh, uh but Sean Payton has just kind of, I don't know. Like I, 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 I get it. I think He's that rough. Russell Wilson thing, again, I just really don't like that handle. And it's like, how is he the new Sean Payton in the Denver? How is he going to handle conflict resolution going forward? Right? Those are all great questions because today's coach that's coming up now is more touchy-feely. Like, we understand. We've got to listen better. We're young. I mean, look at the entire group we just talked about. 10 through through 15 Stefanski early 40s Mike McDaniel what is he 40 O'Connell early 40s Sean Payton Zach Taylor early but late 30s I think maybe maybe he's 40 right now like there's a lot of the same sort of dude there I'm curious about McDaniel we always always have a gripe with Tua like the situation's got to be perfect and how much of this falls on Mike McDaniel like, there is a lot of talent there in Miami. He hasn't been able to win a playoff game. Essentially, week 18 last year was the chance to have a home playoff game and a perfect situation as a two seed. They couldn't finish that up. Why does Tua get all the blame and Mike McDaniel doesn't get any, Bobby? Because we watch it, and we I think we look at, like, what would Tua be without Mike McDaniel? I mean, they had the number one offense. You know, like, other coaches are copying him, right? Like the things that Mike McDaniel does, even that like the little short motion thing where like Tyree Hill squats out and then try and widen the defense, like that got copied. All the other offensive coaches, good ones, copied that mid year. Um, and I I look at again, like he's I I like him now. Again, I have him ninth, right? So I don't have him like top five or anything. You know, I, I things going sour with Vic Fangio, you know, probably can ding him a little bit. I but. have a little bit of an explanation on that. Where I, I I actually did some digging because I was thinking about Mike McDaniel myself, where it's like I, I love him from a brain perspective, but I do think there are some things that he could clean up just as a head coach. And even some of the hard knocks clips that came out from last year were great, where he's talking about like, you know, hey, I, I'm accountable and I'm not perfect. And this play call was shit. I could have helped Tua here when there was a cover zero look instead of, you know, throwing a fade to the end zone. So, you know, that kind of stuff is awesome. And it. And it does seem like he connects with players, even though he's a goober, and it doesn't seem like he would. But the whole thing with Vic Vangio. When did Vic Vangio accept the Eagles' uh, defensive coordinator job? 
like the same day that he was fired, right? Yeah. So, you know, you want to talk about Eagles and tampering and a team that tampers. Oh, there was no tampering there, right? It see and you know, even think back to the Vic Vangio working with the Eagles uh, the year that they played the Chiefs in the Super Bowl. It seemed like that partnership was inevitable to happen sooner rather than later. And then you saw a lot of cryptic tweets from the Dolphins players uh, once Vic Vangio left about, you know, there are some players being unlocked that felt like they should have got more playing time. There was there was uh, there was tension between McDan- Mc- between McDaniel and Vic Vangio. And it seems like Vic Vangio had other shit lined up as soon as the season ends. And as soon as he's fired, he has his other job lined up. Um, not necessarily very focused on what's going on with the Miami Dolphins. So I actually give Mike McDaniel a lot of credit. Of I do think Vic Vangio is an awesome coach, and hey, I would have loved for it to work. But I give McDaniel credit of not forcing it. Hey, let's just get this guy out. He clearly wants to be somewhere else. Um, my big ask for Mike McDaniel this year, and I've talked about this maybe on this show before, I've seen some tendencies of the Miami Dolphins of not getting the plays in time. And if you look at the rate at which the Dolphins run plays, you would think it would be high, right? Because it's a high-octane, fast offense. We're all about being fast. We're all about being explosive. They are a slow offense. They get explosive plays very quickly, but they are a slow offense in terms of the rate at which they run plays. And McDaniel sometimes does not get the play in in time. I would like Mike McDaniel to relinquish play-calling duties at some point. I think that would be a good step for him as a head coach. It could still be his offense, but I would actually like to see him relinquish those duties. That's a big ask. And by the way, your explanation took way more than the play clock. So you would be flagged. I would be flagged. Yeah. Justin's more of an offensive coordinator guy anyways. <laughs> All right. Where are we? Top 10? Top 9? Yeah, we're going We're going into the top 10. And I want to make sure that I'm reading the correct list this time. And by the way, Kevin Stefanski, Mike McDaniel, and Kevin O'Connell were all ranked Back to back to back. And I kind of wanted to talk about three of them, but we but we already, you know, we talked about Mike McDaniel. Let's move to the top 10. Kevin Stefanski comes in at 10. Mike Tomlin at nine. D'Amico Ryans at eight. We have a tie for six with Jim Harbaugh and Matt LaFleur. Dan Campbell is five. John Harbaugh is four. We have a tie for second with Sean McVay and, and Kyle Shanahan. And number one, we have Andy Reid. Now, here's my first question. Kevin did you Spans- say Andy Reid's name, or did you freeze? No, I I, I, I might have froze. Andy Reid is number okay. one. Andy Reid's number one. I thought it was like a drum roll thing. Ah. And Bill Belichick, number one. No. Uh, uh, I wish Bill was here so I could still rank him high out of <laughs> yeah. all you nerds' faces. <laughs> now, here's the thing. Kevin Stefanski, he was the head coach of the year last year, correct? Yes, one he coach was. Of the year? Yeah. Second time in four years. Rose and I... Had Stefanski higher, and I love Kevin Stefanski. Bobby, you had him a little lower than us. Why? So they were. He was in my like fan and fan base that might not like. So twenty twenty was awesome, right? One coach of the year, deservingly so. I actually thought that the, I thought he would have that impact on the team, and he did. You look at last year, like oh wow, successful, successful coaching job. But he is an offensive coach, right? And Jim Schwartz comes in there. Has an awesome defense, but also a little bit of like Dan Quinnism, where it's like, yeah, but good coaches know what you're doing, right? Like that you're this is what we run type of defense. But they had this defense that was actively putting up points and turning, getting turnovers, and they consistently turned the ball over on offense, right? Like just consistently threw away points and gave like so many po- points that other teams scored on the Browns was off of pick sixes or fumbles at the two yard line and stuff like that. And part of that is. Watson has totally fallen apart. Under like Watson was an MVP candidate. He's totally fallen apart. You know, you traded Dobbs because you like DTR's preseason, and then that kind of ended up biting you in the ass. And then I look at past stuff, like where like you had no control over Odell Beckham Jr. Like let that locker room, like let they he let that locker room splinter against Baker Mayfield when you know, and kind of let Odell just make a mess of all of that. So I have Stefanski at. 15. 15. So I'm, I don't I don't have him I don't have him awful but I I don't like him as much as as you guys do. Yeah, I had him 7 rows had him 8. Yeah, it's, I don't know. I I think a lot of this first of all, he didn't have anything to do with the Josh Dobbs stuff. That's an Andrew Barry move. So So he doesn't but I mean if you're an offensive coach and you're like, "Hey, no, like I, we yeah, need Yeah, they to- signed off on him, but you know, Andrew Barry drafted he they admitted 
that they had DTR ranked way higher than most teams did. So they were like, oh, well, we've seen enough in preseason where we can save a little bit of dough, get an ex, uh, extra draft pick, but, and flip. But, so, but head, we're not here to discuss DTR. I think the head coach has so much to do with the 53-man roster more so than the, the GM is more as putting the 90 out there and the head coach is deciding the 53. Well, but like these if, two guys, they work, they work very, very well. They were brought in together. They're both Ivy League guys. Like, they – both get one another. They work sure, really and that's why I ding that decision on Stefanski a little bit. But Kevin Stefanski, I think, has the highest winning percentage of any Browns coach since Marty Schottenheimer, and I don't think it's close. He's won fifty five percent of his games for a what was a laughing stock franchise. Their bad years are eight and nine under him. Those are his bad years. He took he started five quarterbacks last year. Of course, some of them are going to turn the ball over. Frickin now. Has it been yeah, Watson perfect? looks awful. Right. And do you think that that has more to do with Kevin Stefanski's coaching or the fact that he went from a pristine image in Houston as a human being to being the pariah of the NFL? Now, you tell me. Was all that you, stuff known when they traded for him? Or uh, was that? Oh, uh, yeah. This, uh, they traded for him when they knew that he was going to get suspended. So this was not – he was getting a guy who – and I'm not saying I'm not defending Deshaun Watson. I want to make this very clear because I don't know what transpired. They were getting a not the guy who was a three time pro bowler in Houston. They were getting a guy who was what like the hated person in the NFL. And if you think that that has nothing to do with his play on the field, I think you're wrong. This is well, not sure, but they 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 trade they but they traded for him. Yeah, I don't think Kevin Stefanski went into Andrew Barry's office and was like, give me that guy. You don't? I, no. No. No, I don't. So I can't. I guess they don't work Kevin that well Ste together then. But Kevin Stefanski, That's a I don't huge think you decision. Can, but I don't think you can blame the head coach because Deshaun, if you think Deshaun Watson, do you think his life is exactly the same today as it was when he was a pro bowler in 2020? Yeah, but I, no. I, no. I, I agree 100% no. what you're saying, but I think where we're different is like they – the trade they didn't trade before all this stuff happened to happen after no no no, no he was no, no he was he had the most baggage out of any NFL player when they chose to trade for him all and of this the stuff most, was happening and gave him a fully guaranteed contract What's, right yeah, that's, but, that's, but again that's an I, organizational I think I, issue yeah I, I think I go to when we're talking about ranking coaches right and we're making a list of this I think you like you have to consider how a coach could have influence over some of these decisions, but I don't know that. I'm not. I'm not going to rank. You know, for you know, the a, a wide receiver for you know handling that, but like head coach and GM on the franchise quarterback trading all these first round picks. Like I, I, I think that's a. If that's not a collaborative decision, then you know they need to get that GM the fuck out of there. Well. Once again, you're talking about the most successful GM in 40 years. I mean, you can't do that. You have to understand the past, I think, in order to understand. Like, the Cleveland Browns are no longer a joke. People talk about Cleveland that if their quarterback can get back to Pro Bowl form, that is a team, you've said it, Bobby, that could contend for the Super Bowl. We never mentioned that. So it's how just in the a world huge can if, you, though. Well, it is a huge if. I'm not saying that. It, but the point is, is that how can you – blast Kevin Stefanski on one hand and then not give him credit on the other side of this. Well, I am. I got him 15th. I don't have him tw in the 20s. That's I have average. Him 15th. You, have, you have a guy that in four years who's made the playoffs twice and has won two coaches of the year, an average hedge coach. That's what you're calling him, and I don't yeah, understand Yeah, but that's it. because there's a plenty of, that's, that's pl there's a, a lot of above average coaches, so there's good coaches that look average. Yeah, I gotta I gotta side with Rose here. Where I I love I love what Stefanski does on offense. Um, you know, it, it's not just throw the ball, throw the ball, throw the ball. It is it is different. Um, even some of his defenses, even before Jim Schwartz, the, it, the, he's never had a defense at least points wise that's been lower than twenty first. Yeah, man, I, I I have to side with Rose. Where I I think the Deshaun Watson thing, like. I think that's going to go around as the, as the worst contract in NFL history, and it will not even be close. It will not even be close as to being the – it is the worst contract ever. But I think that's a Deshaun Watson issue. The Browns did it, and they need to be held – you know, they should be held responsible for it. 
But I think the fact that you see Joe Flacco coming here, coming in there and looking like a better quarterback than Deshaun Watson. But still looked like a bad quarterback. It was just they won games and it was fun. Right. Right. But that's that is a coaching job. And how many guys were on right. IR? That's yeah, a that's defensive a coaching job. But the offense, too, dude, the number they, they were down to their fifth and sixth tackles. And you could say, well, that's all Callahan. OK, but then maybe it's his. I mean, Kevin Stefanski, you can't pick and choose where you're going to shoot holes in his game and then not raise them up on your shoulders. I just think it's a little unfair. But let, let's move I mean, on. He, Flacco had eight interceptions in five games. I know like they should have been. We, we talked about it. Like, why aren't they in? Why aren't they becoming like a ball control? Like they were. The defense was like going above and be like literally. The defense was putting points up on the board. Like they lost that Steelers game because they had what, what two offensive touchdown? You know, touchdowns returned. Um, you know, and and hey, does Deshaun Watson have a lot more baggage going with him and stuff? But he's still crazy talented, and to not be able to get that to be middle of the tier with you know with with that team, I. I don't know. That's why I have him 15th instead of top 10. I get it. But he also had six games at the end of the 2022 season. Six. Six games where he hadn't played in two years. And then last year, he played his best game and he broke his shoulder. So people would say he was actually getting there. He had put together some decent games, a very, very good game against Baltimore, where he completed every pass in the second half and let it come back. So, you know, who knows? We'll see what this year. If he's healthy... This is where I think you can judge the Watson Stefanski marriage if he plays all 17 games and then we'll move on. But let's move the one that um there's a couple that I'm interested in, but let's start with Mike Tomlin here. Uh Penick. Yeah. We have him ranked ninth overall. I had him sixth, though I probably had him the highest out of all of us. Is this because of do we still think that Mike Tomlin is a great coach? Is he Justin? Is he an elite coach? No, I think he's a good coach. You gotta you you gotta be able to find if you're not an offensive coach, you gotta be able to find some sort of semblance of offense. And Mike Tomlin just hasn't done it, and that's point blank end of story for me. It's been like that for a while too. Yeah, and I really like this. Was the hardest one for me was Mike Tomlin because I really like so much about Mike Tomlin. Right, like the ability to just win games every single year is is fantastic. But I, I, when ranking him, which again I still really like him, I just been like, all right, what is the edge that he gives me? Now he's got that, you know, like we talk about with Harbaugh, who's the CEO type as well. He's put together great offensive coaches. Where Tomlin's put together awful offensive coaches, right? Yeah. And it's been because they just kind of move guys up in the organization when other guys leave. Uh, for me, with Tomlin, you know, the fact that he's never had a losing season. I know we kind of gloss over that, but when it's you think ins- it's it, amazing, it is amazing because go look at the guys who are ahead of him and go look at their worst year, right? Andy Reid, I think he went four and 12 one year in Philly, right? Kyle Shanahan, he's picked in the top five before. Sean McVay, they hit the crapper a few seasons ago. Heck, even John Harbaugh, I don't know what their his worst record is. I know it's not that bad. I think it might have been like a six and 10. But my point is, is that their worst moments are pretty low. Mike Tomlin's worst moment is eight and eight. Yeah, like that is in, that is incredible to me. And he's been through all sorts of situations. Yes, uh, their shortcomings offensively and hiring the staff and identifying the quarterback post Roethlisberger. Absolutely, those are well. Short the winning counts. has hurt them in finding the quarterback, right? Yes. Like, and, and I don't, I don't hold that against Mike Tomlin because they've never really been in a position to really upgrade mm-hmm. a quarterback, right? Um, you know, so like, so I, I really like Mike Tomlin. It's just the offensive coaching for the last handful of years has been pretty bad. And that's why I lean good. Like I, I don't, yeah. I don't consider him great. I think he's a, I think he's a good coach. And in a way you are, which you are, what your record says you are right. So, you know, eight, nine, nine and eight, if that's a steal is worse, but it feels much worse. Did the Steelers have any and what's their, chance? What's been their best over the last five years? Was it that year they lost to the Browns in the in the playoff where they started off like eight and zero, nine and zero, or whatever? Yeah, yeah, they, and the, yeah, they were unbeaten for a long time, and then they just fell, and then they got beat by the Browns. It just walk. feels worse than it always is. It's like even if the Steelers are nine and eight, if your team goes up against the Steelers tomorrow, you're saying that I got a chance here, <laughs> you know, and that's not. 
It's not what you want. So, well, they haven't won a playoff game in eight seasons now. No, if there was one playoff game that was that you knew you didn't have to watch last year, it was it was the Bills versus Steelers. Just That's didn't fair. just didn't have to watch it. That's fair. Even though Mason right. Rudolph is three zero. Panic. What else you got? Uh, oh, you see, now we get to the top, and yeah, it's you like know. you could flip coins. We we I want to do this Andy Reid topic because I'm going to flip it on you guys. Oh yeah, okay. So let's just let's just shoot up to number one. Let's just shoot up to number one. We we even talked we talked about Harbaugh, Dan Campbell. I feel like maybe I feel bad that maybe you don't talk about. We we know that they're good. We know that they're good coaches. Jim Harbaugh. Jim Harbaugh will be a conversation just as the year goes on. But Rose and I, we have Andy Reid number one. He's the only coach to a. The only coach in the NFL to have multiple Super Bowl wins as a head coach in the NFL right now. Bobby, you had him four. Mm-hmm. Tell me why. So this is this is more about my th- top three than it is, you know, oh, fuck Andy Reid, right? I'm having four. But my number one is Sean McVay. My number two is John Harbaugh. My number three is Kyle Shanahan. I want to flip this question on you guys. Because if you ask me to say why I don't like it, like Andy Reid's a great coach. There's not many reasons why I could say he's not a great coach. But here's my where I want to flip it on you guys. Tell me why those three guys are worse coaches than Andy Reid. Two of them have won a Super Bowl. One has been uh, been to two as a head coach. Why are those guys worse coaches than Andy Reid? They're not, in my opinion. I mean, I got, I got down. I think I did it from top to bottom. So I actually started here instead of going in reverse order. And I could have put... I would have put Shanahan one and McVay two and Reed three. I, and I wouldn't have blinked. I don't have a reason yeah. other than he's got multiple wins. And I think probably the thing that separates him a little bit is the fact that they got rid of one of the most talented players in the NFL in Tyreek Hill and have won two Super Bowls since then. To me, that shows me something. Absolutely. He's a great head coach. So I'm not, I, again, so it's, it's always funny when you're arguing like yeah. among the top four, it's like, well, yeah. this guy's a little bit, bit greater. Yeah. You, like um, but like the arguments against Shanahan is like, oh, hasn't won the big game, has uh, gave up leads. Okay, before Patrick Mahomes came, did Andy Reid blow some big leads? I mean, did Andrew yes. Luck? Remember Andrew yeah, Luck against, down whatever totally. in the fourth quarter? You know, and I actually I think he's the worst time management wise out of Horrible. those guys. Horrible. Um, and we look at criteria. I think he's been the worst in creating. You know, good coach like you know Nagy, Bianami, um, who's the other. Uh, offensive coordinator that got a job out of uh, P- Peterson's been pretty good, so you know he's been all right. But just McVeigh to me is number one, like what he does offensively, being like again elevating talent. Look at last year; they had the worst draft capital out of everyone, and they had the best rookie class. You know, I know that is part GMing, but it's part like identifying guys and putting them in the role. Like Sean McVeigh's just as involved as as the GM is. Um, you know, being like, hey, you know what? We're going to take this Cooper Cup guy and turn him into this power slot. He's going to be huge for our blocking, right? You know, uh, so they, he's created a lot of coaches. He's been copied by a lot of guys. He's, you know, so Sean McF- you know, won a Super Bowl, got Jared Goff to a Super Bowl when he was a worse player than what he is now. Um, I, I, th- I think Sean McVay is the, the best head coach in the NFL. I'll give my case for Andy Reid. And first of all, when Steve Spagnolo was let go from the Giants, I don't necessarily know if people were banging down the door to hire him as a defense coordinator. And if anything, I Chiefs kind of, fans wanted him fired at one point, you know. Yeah, kind of people kind of viewed him as like, all right, the league has maybe kind of moved on from you here a little bit from, you know, just all right, we're gonna hit Tom Brady in two thousand seven. And now Steve Spaggs is he ain't going anywhere. He, he I don't think he's got a head coaching job. He's in his sixties and he he's there as long as he wants to be there. And he's got guys that are working really well. So Andy Reid gets should get a lot of credit for hiring Steve Spagnolo. I think they did. Maybe they worked together when they were in Philadelphia. I think that was the case. But also, you've seen at certain points, we'll put Josh Allen and, and Patrick Mahomes on the same playing field here because the, that as they should, elite quarterbacks. You've seen at certain points, Josh Allen struggle a little bit with the transition of how defenses are playing him. And it's like, Josh, man, you got to be patient. You got to be more patient. You got to check that. You got to take that check down. You gotta, we, we can't be forcing all these turnovers, blah, 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 blah. And that's all. This is all while um, Josh Allen is at Stefan Diggs, by the way. Rose, totally agree with you. We're trading away Tyreek Hill and in a way being more successful Super Bowl wise. But then also Patrick Mahomes, even though the national storyline has said in the past that 
oh, Mahomes is struggling here, Mahomes is struggling there. Mahomes has never really struggled. Maybe he struggled relatively to what he was doing early in his career with just explosive, 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 and all these high EPA per play tiers that he was in, and he was in, he was on, in his own level, on his own tier of play, but he really has seamlessly transitioned from, all right, we're going to be, a, we're going to be throw it down the field. We're going to be improvise, 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 do it. He's still doing all that stuff while also being such a master of the check down, master of the offense. And I think Reed, even though it is Patrick Mahomes, I think Reed deserves credit for helping Patrick Mahomes transition from, all right, well, teams are going to try and blitz you and you can kill them. Now teams aren't going to try and blitz you. You still got to kill them. And that'd be my that'd be my same argument for Andy Reid too. Like that is like if you ask me to make an argument, it'd be exactly what Justin said. Is like how they've changed the offense due to, uh, to their personnel, right? Like coaching up Travis, like the way that him and Mahomes and Kelsey can just freestyle out there. Like that doesn't you know they they're not going against their coach, right? Their coach is setting them up for stuff like that. Um, you know, and like you said, without the wide receivers this year, adjusting to what they're doing. And I, I'm really excited for the adjustment this year now that they added Hollywood Brown and um, Xavier Worthy, right? Like, are they going to try and really start to generate some more explosives as teams, again, will continue to work on, like, the quick game, get the ball out, low average depth of target stuff. So so those are all great arguments for Andy Reid. It's just – it's so, it's so when, you're, when you're debating who have the four best or the best, it's hard to – it's hard to make bad points against them. Can I uh, can I give you my Sean McVay impression? Yes. Yes. Well, listen, Matthew has been great this year. I think he's done an awesome job. I mean, Cooper's incredible. Uh, I looked at Les when Puka was still on the board in the fifth round. I was like, we can use that guy and turn him into a star. That's Bobby, pretty good. Your your impression next. Uh, the only impression I can do is a John Gruden one. He's not on this list anymore. He's so not on this I, list. I brought up John Gruden, and we moved off the Sean Payton point. That that's where I'm a little worried. Which and I loved I loved Gruden, right? Where it's like it it felt like it felt like Sean Payton's like second version of him is like John Gruden's. Where it's like it's kind of it's the instead of it's the Raiders show, it's the John Gruden show. Where it's like it feels like it's the Sean Payton show in Denver. Anyways, well, let's not go back and yeah, argue Shane please. Payton. I would add, I would finish it with this, and I don't, I don't want to take another ten minutes. If Bill Belichick had returned to New England, where would he rank on this list right now? Two years ago, it would have been one, but the last two years, the way he handled that offensive coaching staff and that was was really brutal, right? It was a little too full of himself and I Bill Belichick's my football hero. So but if we were going if he was still here, I would probably put him somewhere between six to eight. Oh. Cause he's still oh he was still a great defensive coach through all these years. The defense and, and again, not with top tier talent. But the way they handled things offensively last year, benching Mac time after time. It, it it left you know putting Joe Judge and Bill O'Brien as the offensive coordinator and QB coach. No, Matt Patricia. Those, or yeah, that's I meant Matt Patricia. Who did I say? <laughs> you said Bill <laughs> O'Brien. Oh yeah, Matt Patricia. <laughs> uh, but chin. It's that was just, the same year. <laughs> it 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 was a really bad last two years. Again, if we go from any year before the last two years on, he's my number one. I Rose. I I think you. I think we. I would have to put him like fifteen to twenty. Oh, wow. get the fuck out of here. I think you just hate defensive coaches is what it is. <laughs> I, I, I think it's more along the lines of uh, that separating Bill Belichick, the coach, from Bill Belichick, the evaluator, the yeah. is a hard, hard thing to do right now because he's got nobody in the history of the sport had their fingerprints over an organization more so than him. No, and he was great at it. He just fell off in the at the end the last five years or so. Yeah, but that's that's what we're talking about is where do you – I mean, I think he could still, like, if you put him with the Dallas Cowboys roster, are Holy they a shit. Super Bowl? Are they a Super Bowl favorite? Absolutely. And we forget the first year of Mac with Josh McDaniels. Like they were, you know they they were they were a good team, right? People were you know taking, oh look, you guys said all these guys are generational. Mac Jones is the best of them all. Guy went to the Pro Bowl. So it's just those, but those last two, these last two years were very, they were just awful offensively. I say this privately and quietly as a Giants fan, where it's like, well, if John Mayer and Bill Belichick really want to reunite, and if Bill really wants to come home, 
I have to, I can't believe I'm saying this. I have to include it with uh, Josh McDaniels has to be my offense coordinator. That is the yeah. only way, that is the only way I will even entertain that statement. I think he has to wait to take an NFL job until his girlfriend gets off of her parents' oh, insurance. Oh, come on. 26 hey, we years. don't want to talk about wives and girlfriends, that, <laughs> you know. Um, that's that's insane, Bill. But, <laughs> hey, Bill be Bill. Wait, you don't think that he's actually shot up the charts in some people's estimation? In the players' minds, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> game recognizes the game. All right, guys, this was fun. This was a good, fun list. Hopefully, everybody learned something. Hopefully. Uh, so we're back at it again early next week for Bobby Skinner, for Justin Pennick, for Matty Mass, who's filling in for Audio Mikey. We really appreciate it. I am Chris Rose. We will see you next week here on Football Today.